In light of the recent scandals with NSA and the IRS and what seems like an ever-increasing and present government in our lives, I hear a lot of worries about Big Brother, you know, tyranny from the government. But a question to ask is, is this tyranny happening in our lives because another tyranny has already happened? Is this the right tyranny to worry about? Or is there something else, a tyranny of our own making? Neil Postman certainly thought so. In 1985, he wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in it, he compared the two dystopian novels, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and George Orwell's 1984. The introduction is worth the price of the book. Here's what he wrote. We were keeping our eye on 1984. When the year came and the prophecy didn't, thoughtful Americans sang softly in praise of themselves. The roots of liberal democracy had held. Wherever else the terror had happened, we at least had not been visited by our Orwellian nightmares. But we had forgotten that alongside Orwell's dark vision, there was another, slightly older, slightly less well-known, equally chilling, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Contrary to common belief, even among the most educated, Huxley and Orwell did not prophesy the same thing. Orwell warns that we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression. But in Huxley's vision, no big brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture. In 1984, people are controlled by inflicting pain. And Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. This book, Postman wrote, is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. See, the enemy for Postman wasn't big government. And it wasn't even this movie with too many cuss words or this song with too many sexual innuendos. It was entertainment itself. It was when entertainment took over culture that we would actually become a trivial culture. We would not know the difference between what was really important and what really didn't matter. We would be captive to our own distractions. Postman, again, writing almost 30 years ago, realized that entertainment was becoming too much of our daily lives. In fact, we were now becoming a culture that saw all of life through the lens of entertainment. Well, how does entertainment shape our culture and shape our thinking? Well, first, it's loaded with ideas. And we all know that ideas have consequences. Every movie, every TV show, every song, every game is giving us a vision of reality, something to believe about truth or something to pursue as the definition of the good life or something to believe about God or ourselves. The difference, though, is when it comes to entertainment, these ideas that are being presented to us aren't argued. There's, they're not being debated openly. C.S. Lewis once said that the most dangerous ideas in a society aren't the ones that are argued, but the ones that are assumed. And through entertainment, ideas are assumed. They're embedded. Who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Who we should cheer for and who should we boo. The arts have an enormous power to present ideas without actually having to, to argue them. Andrew Fletcher once said, let me make the ballads of a nation and I need not care who writes its laws. And this is why as Christians, we can't just ignore entertainment because it is shaping the culture around us and to ignore it is to ignore the forces that are driving the reality in which we live. But it's not only the ideas. Entertainment often turns a culture from participants in the culture to spectators of the culture. Our habit becomes that the movie goes on and our brain goes off. We think that being informed about something is the same thing as acting upon it and doing something about it. That disliking something we see on the news is the same thing as standing against unrighteousness or liking something is the same thing as standing for justice. But we're turned into very passive observers to the culture around us. And the worst case scenario is we just stop caring because all we're looking for is that next entertainment high. In the sequel to Brave New World, a book that was called Brave New World Revisited, Aldous Huxley remarked that the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. 
And this is why, church, we can't just replace entertainment with Christian entertainment. If we're distracted from loving our neighbor, if we're distracted from doing the good we can, if we're distracted from actually being productive in the world, does it really matter if that distraction has Jesus loves you in the lyrics or not? Distraction is distraction if it keeps us from living out the gospel in the real world around us. And a third way is that our role models become celebrities instead of heroes. As my mentor Bill Brown once said, in other countries, heroes made history. In our countries, they make CDs and touchdowns. We idolize our role models. We become those role models that we worship. And a culture that worships celebrity instead of heroes is a culture that will always choose style over substance. We'll choose to look good rather than be good. And so what can we do? Well, first, we need to obey the scriptural mandate to test everything. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything that we watch, we need to be asking the question, how is this defining terms? What is this saying about life in the world? What is this saying about revenge and right and wrong and justice and truth and eternity and God and morality? We need to understand that these messages are everywhere. And if we turn our brains off, we're allowing someone else to think thoughts for us. Our brains always need to be active and need to be on. In a sense, Christians should never veg out. Second, we need to have some sacred space. We need to have some place in our lives where it's a no entertainment zone. In other words, we need to have some time where there's no rectangles allowed. As my friend David Eaton of Axis says, sometimes we spend most of our life through the lens of rectangles, looking at screens. We need to have some sacred space just to think and to reflect. A third thing we need to do is celebrate great art and celebrate great artists. The answer isn't that we should have no TV or no movies or no games. The question is we need to determine the difference between what is authentically artistic and what is just popular. Popular is not the same thing as good. And so we need to encourage the young artists that we come across, whether it's those in, the, in, in classical music or those in popular music, whether it's those who are trying to paint paintings or those who are trying to make movies. We need to encourage them towards excellence and not to settling for just producing something that will distract us. Rosie D. Rose, who used to teach up at Moody Bible Institute, once said that the difference between a good book and a bad book is that a good book takes you deeper into life and a bad book distracts you from life. I think that's a pretty good lens on how we can know what to celebrate and what not to celebrate. A good movie, a good TV show, a good game, a good artistic expression makes me think deeper about the world around us. A bad one is just distracting. And lastly, we might just need to replace some of the time we spend in front of the television or in front of the computer screen or in front of a game with some books. Read some good books. This will help us cultivate a love for the, for the better things when we read really good books. I'm reminded here of what C.S. Lewis once said. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, he said, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. In other words, he said, we are far too easily pleased. And that's a great description when it comes to entertainment.